Hey Providence family, so glad you're tuning in for another Bible reading plan video. These past few weeks of our reading were really powerful and the books that we are headed into this week absolutely continue on that trend. Starting today, we'll begin our trek through both Ezra and Nehemiah. If you've never spent a lot of time in either of these books before, let me start by giving us some background. So originally in the Jewish scriptures, we would read Ezra and Nehemiah as one cohesive story. Scholars believe that they are unified by a single author. So when you're thinking about the theme and trajectory of the book that you're reading, I want you to think of the two books as paired together on purpose. You'll see why in a bit. As we finished up 2 Kings, we were seeing both of the kingdoms of Israel taken into captivity. We saw the king of Assyria carry the Israelites away to Assyria in chapter 17. And then we saw the people of Judah taken into captivity by Babylon in chapter 25. Things don't seem particularly peachy for the Israelites these days. The beginning of Ezra um, is set 50 years after Judah was taken into Babylon. And some of the exiles are now returning back to Jerusalem. At this point, Persia has just been overflown by Babylon King Nabon, and it now is in control of former Israel and Judah. Between both of these books, there are three leaders who divide up the book. Most of these chapter divisions and separations come from what I've been learning through watching Bible projects, studying notes, so feel free to go there um, in your ESV study Bible for more information. So. We've got leaders Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. With each of these leaders' stories, you'll see a parallel three-part design. These separations help us see the connections between the two books. So, the parallel three-part design looks like this. First, we'll see a Persian king is moved by God to send the leader back to Jerusalem. Then, we'll see that leader facing some opposition towards what he is set to do. And finally, we'll witness the story coming to a strange anticlimactic closing. It'll be very weird, you'll see. So Ezra one through six is highlighting the leader Zerubbabel, who is seeking to rebuild the temple. So chapter one through two, with the first part of our sequence, we'll see King Cyrus of Persia, who is moved by God to allow exiles to return to Jerusalem. He charges Zerubbabel to lead this group back. And then when he gets to Jerusalem for his opposition, he'll face a set of opposition in chapter four, where Israelite grandchildren who never went into exile in the first place come to help rebuild the temple. Seems great, right? But then for our anticlimactic ending, Zerubbabel is angered by their offer and refuses their help. This is that anticlimactic moment because prophets had been claiming that all the tribes of Israel and all nations would come together and worship when, God, um, when God's kingdom comes. So this feels strangely opposite of what the prophets had envisioned. And that's the end of the section. So if you feel like that's a weird ending, you should. The next leader we read about is actually Ezra, shown in chapters Ezra 7 through 10. This is happening 60 years after what we just read in Zerubbabel's story. Ezra's main objective is to head back into his hometown to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. Remember our three-part design order? In chapter 7 through 8, King Artaxerxes of Persia appoints Ezra to lead another wave of exiles back to Jerusalem. This king is allowing Ezra to return to bring about spiritual and social renewal. So when Ezra gets there in chapters 9 and 10, he faces opposition when he learns that many of the exiled Israelites who had come back had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of these spouses were Israelites, but some of them weren't. So now recall in Deut Deuteronomy 23, one through four, God does command that his people be separated from the other nations in marriage. So Ezra begins to fear with that in mind that spouses of Israelites will be as bad as the Canaanites and corrupt the Israelites just like before. 
So for our anticlimactic ending, Ezra offers a prayer of repentance and gathers some leaders around him to help initiate a divorce decree that says that these marriages must end and their wives and children sent away. This decree is only partially carried out. But this is similar to that awkward ending we felt before because we never see God command Ezra to end these marriages. We know from Malachi 2, 13 through 16, that God opposes divorce. So we're left scratching our heads once again. Finally, as we begin the book of Nehemiah, we read of our last leader, Nehemiah. Nehemiah's goal for returning is to rebuild the city walls. This section is marked in chapters 1 through 7. So, first, as Nehemiah is serving as a per the Persian government as a cupbearer, we already see God's provision for how he will carry out his plan for bringing more exiles back to Jerusalem. King Artaxerxes grants Nehemiah permission to return to Jerusalem and even sends him with armed forces and resources to make sure he gets to Jerusalem. This has to be God's favor over Israelites to make this happen. Then in chapter 4, Nehemiah faces his opposition. Those already living in the land begin to oppose the wall building. In this case, Nehemiah tells them that they have no part in the new Jerusalem. Once again, we're left with this strange ending because the prophets had been envisioning a no walls, all nations kind of Jerusalem. This certainly seems to counter those visions. So to conclude the book of Nehemiah, the author gives us two sections that the Bible Project helps illustrate really well. One more positive and one more negative. So our positive section is chapters 8 through 12, and the downer is chapter 13. So in this first section, we see all of this spiritual renewal. The exiles are gathering for a festival. They're reading and teaching the Torah, celebrating the Feast of Booths to remember God's faithfulness. There's also confession of sins, covenant renewal, a vow to follow the Torah, and great celebration over the temple. This all seems super encouraging. But then when we get to chapter 13, we see that, that this wasn't any kind of renewal at all. Nehemiah finds out through a series of events that people actually haven't changed. The unique examples Nehemiah shows of Israel's behavior correlate to undoing the work that each of the leaders were trying to do in the first place. He sees that the people haven't been fulfilling their covenant vows, which is a clear example of temple, temple neglect, which is all that Zerubbabel was working towards. Next, we see everyone is violating the Torah and working on the Sabbath, which is distinctly dishonoring the Torah's laws. One of the things that Ezra was working towards. And Nehemiah's own work towards rebuilding the wall is compromised as the people set up markets within inside of the city walls. This conclusion brings somewhat hope at the beginning, but then ends in disappointment as we see that even though Israel is back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. We saw Ezra and Nehemiah working really hard with political and social reforms, but neither of them are addressing the heart problem of the people. This points out that if we are ever going to love and obey God, we simply can't do it by changing our behavior. We, just like these Israelites, are in need of a holistic transformation of the heart to live like God has intended. So that's the adventure of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. As you read this week, meditate on how easily these Israelites are led down the wrong path as their hearts lack true submission unto the Lord. And maybe consider what ways that you are trying to fix an inward problem with an outward solution. Enjoy reading.